Hello, my name is Liam. I am being joined today by Dr. Mel Hauser of All Brains Belong. Hello, Mel. Hi, Liam. Thanks for having me. Um, so, I have some questions for you. And I'm, and I'm so happy to have you here to ask them. Amazing. I'm, for happy to, I'm, I'm so happy to be here to answer them. <laughs> it's an honor. First of all, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns and visual description. I am, um, uh, I've got pale skin, short brown hair, and I am wearing a like teal and white tank top. Um, and I am the founder and executive director of All Brains Belong Vermont. I am a new nonprofit 501c3 organization in Montpelier. That is so cool. Maybe I should introduce myself. Um, my name is Liam. I use they, them pronouns. I, uh, I also have pale skin and even shorter brown hair now, and I am wearing glasses, and they are regular glasses. Everything else is part of my Spamton cosplay. I am wearing my Spamton cosplay to an interview. Love it. Authenticity. <laughs> yes, uh, that exactly. I figured of all people, you would be okay with that. And Absolutely. Besides, it's, my, it's my most formal outfit, so... Win-win. Win. Yes, but speaking of, of the, in, well, let's get back to the interview. Why did you first be, decide to become a doctor? Great question. I actually did not always want to become a doctor. I wanted to do a whole bunch of different things. And in fact, I did do a whole bunch of different things before my road to medicine. But I think what all of the different things that I have done have all kind of had in common is that I really love people's stories. I'm very interested in people's stories and kind of figuring out what goes on in people's internal worlds and like what makes them tick and understand their point of view um, and, and, and try as best I can to, to, to support um, their, you know, authentic best lives. And so um, I've been a doctor for the past 10 years um, and um, I, I'm a family doctor, so I care for babies through older adults, you know, so people of all ages and often, often um, multi-generational families. That is so cool. Um, I, speaking of you, your bio on the official All Brains Belong website, which we'll get into what All Brains Belong is in just a minute, but the bio on the website says you were diagnosed of autism at, at the age of 37. How did this affect your life and your career? In every single way <laughs> imaginable. Um, like many late identified autistic adults, um, I had had the experience of always feeling like there was something different about me and like uh, in like subtle ways. Um, and I had no real lens for, for understanding that. And like many um, late identified adults, like, oh, it just kind of felt like I wasn't doing the thing in the way it was supposed to be done. Um, but, but, but really then I, you know, when I came to learn that we all have different brains that do things differently. And when a, a, a lot of times people first, and this is like super unfortunate, but a lot of times people first learn that they're autistic in the context of like becoming profoundly dysregulated. And so like my experience um, in early COVID as a doctor caring for patients, like sick patients in the hospital, in the office, and like homeschooling my then toddler. And like, anyway, uh, entered something called autistic burnout and where basically I lost the ability to mask and mm -hmm. um, like started showing up um, authentically um, for the first time. And cause I like, lost the brain, the brain functions needed to mask. And oh. that is how a lot of adults first learn that they are autistic. And I can't wait for the day where people learn about their brains without reaching profound levels of dysregulation. Mm. Well, I, I also have experience with autism. I am not a late diagnosed person. I was diagnosed at two years old, which is nearly impossible for an assigned female at birth person. And 
I, I know what you're talking yeah. about in, in some ways. Um, I, yes, it does affect all areas of your life, and you don't even notice it sometimes. But sometimes it's a good thing. Yeah. Can I tell you a, can I tell you a story? Yes. Like an unscripted story? We've got plenty so, of time. Go ahead. Amazing. So I was having a conversation with my autistic five-year-old um, about... Um, like, hey, um, I'm doing, a, you know, a, a, a group with my patients, like teaching them about autism. What do you think I should tell them? Um, I'm, I'm working with a group of people who like wonders if they're autistic or not. And my five year old says, well, um, I have a really awesome brain. I have the kind of brain that can see patterns and make connections between ideas that other people don't make. And I was so proud because like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is a strength of many autistic brains. Um, and I think that if we can build a world where little kids recognize that we all have different brains that do things differently and we all have unique patterns of things that we're good at and things that are hard, um, this way, um, we we just build a life that works for our brain. Yes, that you must be so proud of her. She sounds very <laughs> wise. Oh, she's so wise, like well beyond her years, totally. Mm. Um, I have a, a quick unscripted question, but it shouldn't be too hard. Were you diagnosed during COVID? I was. I was oh. diagnosed um, in May of 2021. Oh, good for you. Thank you. Yeah, and so I learned during COVID, I learned that I was ADHD. That came first. A lot of times that is what comes first um, because of all the stereotypes out there. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so, so, so anyway, I learned I was ADHD. And then six months later, um, I learned that I was also autistic, dyslexic, dyscalculic, mm -hmm. and dyspraxic. And had I, I often wonder, you know, a lot of, a lot of late identified adults talk about how if only I had known this about myself my whole life, I would not have felt so broken and defective. I wouldn't have felt like a broken neurotypical. I would have just known that I was autistic and I do things differently. Yeah. And then a lot of people who were identified in childhood they have the experience of um, it's not all so rosy because there are um, there is still stigma and there is still the assumption that there's like one correct and default way to be a human and that anyone else needs to conform with that default there's you know there's one right way to play and there's one right way to learn and there's one right way to do the thing anyway i wonder like was that your experience like that that vibe yes definitely i in i was despite my autism i was actually quite advanced in elementary school and there weren't many programs for people who were beyond or below the standard Yes. And that's still, that's still often true. Um, and so, um, I, a lot of, I, yeah. oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I know that I spent most of my days in school either bored or frustrated. I had a 504 plan and it was very long list of things that definitely, I don't even know if they would be considered disabilities were listed as disabilities and things for teachers to look out for. So I, I appreciate that I had that, but it was also very othering. Very othering, right. Um, um, it was listed that I had a strong sense of justice, and this was considered a dis disability. <laughs> so stories like that, like I think they're important stories to tell um, because it's just so ridiculous on its face, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so, I mean, so, so I have a, uh, what, what's, uh, anyway, there, 
anyway, I, I think that until we really as a society can zoom out and say we all have different brains that do things differently, we're still going to, you know, anytime we have like a default way to do the thing. So if the default is like, thou shalt not speak out against injustices, it's rude. If like that's the default, if you have the kind of brain that um, recognizing recognizes inequity, recognizes, mm -hmm. um, you know, things that are arbitrary and make no sense, um, and like vehemently advocates for like what, what, is right to your nervous system like yeah if we pathologize that we are missing out on supporting like really important work to be done in our society you explained it so much better than i could thank you <laughs> uh, it's uh it's it's i think it's 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 um easier to zoom out and describe patterns when you're not talking about your own life sometimes yes very much so that, that is something you are very good at. My my brain is a lot more disorganized. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and uh, I I I think it's a, a lot of practice too. Um, mm -hmm. Of and and I think that many autistic and I, I I have many things about my brain that is that that are disorganized, especially mm -hmm. when I don't have enough dopamine. Um, but um, and or I don't have enough like visual support. Um, so even, you know, I appreciated you as a journalist that you sent me some questions ahead of time um, because there are many brains that um, process information best visually. Um, and so um, even even in the like forget journalism for a second, like even my organization, which which Maybe I'll, maybe I'll tell you about, um, mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but anyway, um, uh, we are currently um, uh, hiring um, an employee like for, for a position and for all people, not just people who disclose that they have a disability, not just people who ask for this as an accommodation, but all the people are being sent their interview questions ahead of time because that is oh. neuro inclusive. That sounds wonderful. I wish more places would do that. Me too. And I think that whenever I have brought this concept to like, because we do, um, we do trainings for employers who are looking to become neuro inclusive, um, and or more neuro inclusive. And when I bring that up about the whole, you know, processing visually versus auditorily do to do, um, people are like, Oh, oh, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, that never occurred to me. Um, and so I think it's just about like, so many other areas of social justice there's this element of abled privilege and um i i've been really impressed by the com like our local community's openness to just learning about things that really haven't been talked about um as, as much as other areas of marginalization and especially when we think about the many ways in which people are marginalized and othered, and we think about the intersectionality um, of, 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 of marginalization, um, neurodivergence um, and, and, and disability and access, like these topics are really important. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I have a bit of an impromptu story myself. I actually, I, I missed out on my first ever job opportunity because in the interview I mentioned that I had OCD. And hopefully that won't be a thing in the future. So meaning you disclosed a disability and you were discriminated against? Yes. I'm so sorry that that happened. Well, it worked out because I ended up here instead. Hmm, yeah, right, mm -hmm. like all the roads. Um, and, and, and being able to zoom out and reframe that is really powerful. And it was also so wrong and inappropriate that you were discriminated against. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that there is so much stigma, which is why it is very hard for people to show up authentically, you know, as their true selves in various mm -hmm. Um, context of education, employment, socially, because there is the fear of discrimination. And it's real. It's not like an irrational fear. Yes, it is definitely. Like there, are, real. there are some places where you just can't be your authentic self at the moment. And that's really sad. And yeah, it's not safe. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I would love it if I could dress up in cosplay every day, but that's just not possible at the moment. Not in all contexts, but the idea would be that you are in an environment and to the extent that people have control over their environments, um, and some people don't, a lot of people don't, um, but, but the idea would be to seek out environments and people in those environments that support authenticity when, when, when that's possible. Um, until we can shift the broader community conversation around neurodiversity and inclusion, which is exactly what we're trying to do here at All Brains Belong. So um, I can mm -hmm. tell you, do you want me to tell you yes. more about that? Speaking of All Brains Belong, that's my next question. What is All Brains Belong? Yeah. Um, so as I uh, mentioned um, a little bit before, um, uh, we are a nonprofit 501 organization in Montpelier. Uh, we are a community health organization dedicated to supporting the well-being and inclusion of people with all types of brains. Um, because um, one in five people learns, thinks, and or communicates differently than the so-called typical brain, even though like I really don't think there is a typical brain. Um, uh, you know, I think this is more like a continuum. Um, but, you know, even though there's no default, default brain, there's like many defaults in society, in healthcare, education, employment. So anyway, what, what All Brains Belong does is um, kind of reimagines these big systems um, and provides healthcare, education, and community social connection opportunities um, in flexible, multiple different ways um, mm. so that people have freedom and choice to pick what works for them. So it is about one, supporting um, the neurodivergent community and um, shifting the broader community conversation around neurodiversity and inclusion. Sounds wonderful. Um, that also answers my next question, which was what does All Brains Belong do? So you're ahead of the game, thank you. Oh, woman, oh, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's um, uh, and, yes. Um, so like, I, but, but to you know, provide more, more details, um, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to. So, so for 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 healthcare, um, uh, myself and Sierra Miller is a nurse practitioner, and we provide neurodiversity affirming healthcare. Um, we have primary we have primary care patients, and we have folks who receive their primary care elsewhere who come to us for support around brain and nervous system health and the uh, common co-occurring. Uh, conditions such as uh, various autoimmune diseases um, that that are that are common in the neurodivergent community, but we we take care of people with all types of brains, infants through older adults. So you know it's it's um it's 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 not only neurodivergent patients uh, because as it turns out, universal design or having those like flexible multimodal options for engagement benefits everyone. So. Um, you know, for example, um, there's no right way to make an appointment. Like you don't have to pick up the phone to call. You can book online, you know, you can email, you can text. We have secure email and secure texting. So like people who have the kind of brains where it's not like a big deal to pick up the phone and make an appointment and stay on hold for an hour to do that. Like if that's like people can do that, they still might prefer to have options because so flexibility, having freedom and choice like benefits everyone, which is why, you know, a lot of people come here even though they don't identify as neurodivergent. Okay, so that was that, that also answers my next question. I was wondering if you see all people or just neurodivergent people. Yeah, all people, all ages, birth through older adulthood. And Wonderful. then our community programs are open to everyone, even if you're not receiving health care from us. So um, we have. Um, social connection opportunities like bringing people together based on shared interests like we have this um this program called kid connections for kids age three to 17 um you know open 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 to people with all different types of brains all about like customized matchmaking with um in pairs or small groups of people who share the same interests you know so like if if, if, if someone's super interested in dinosaurs, we will find you someone else who's super passionate about dinosaurs, that kind of thing. And so, um, cause it turns out when you bring people together based on interests, not necessarily based on diagnoses, like that's a more authentic um, yeah. connection. 
I wish that that kind of thing had been available when I was a kid. I didn't make any close friends until Dungeons and Dragons in, in my junior year of high school, so that would have been very useful for someone like me. Right. So if you had, you know, so, so, so autistic and ADHD brains um, are monotropic. Um, so fewer <laughs> things captivate our interests, right, and do so more intensely than other brains. And so if you bring, if I'm super passionate about um, fish, and all I want to do, not, not, that was, that was, uh, I'm going to rewind, I'm going to try that again. So um, if I'm super passionate about fish, and all I can think and talk about is fish, and all I can take in information about that is meaningful and relevant to me in the context of my monotropic attention system is fish. And you bring me to a group where people are talking about cars and turtles and pizza, like my brain literally cannot engage with that. And so if you bring me to, a, to, to meet a person who's like super passionate about fish, um, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna get dopamine during that interaction. And I have a dopamine bound brain. And so you bring people together who share that interest, they both get dopamine and like, boom. Can um, you tell me a bit more about what a dopamine bound brain is? Oh, I would be happy to because my <laughs> would that bring you dopamine? interest is brains. So yeah, yeah, I would love to. Give me, that would give me dopamine to talk about dopamine for sure. Um, so anyway, um, so uh, dopamine is a brain chemical that is implicated in um, attention, motivation, reward, pleasure, um, and dopamine feels good to everybody, but there are many, many nervous systems that are wired such to really require dopamine for everything, for motor coordination, for starting and stopping an activity or a thought. Um, and so when the dopamine bound brain does not have dopamine, we call that inertia. An object in motion stays in motion like the physics concept. It's either foot on the brake, like I can't initiate the thing. I can't get out of bed in the morning. I can't start. And foot on the gas. Uh, I can't stop doing the thing. I can't stop saying the same thing over and over. I can't stop picking my skin. I can't stop focusing on that video game. It's foot on the gas, foot on the brake. Either way, it uh, feels terrible to the dopamine bound brain. All right, I, I think I understand. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're very welcome. And I think that like a lot of times things are thought about as like willful and intentional when really it is an involuntary or automatic thing that happens from not having enough dopamine. So like a kid will get feedback that they are, um, you know, they're not, they're not paying attention in school or something. Well, it's because that topic doesn't give dopamine. Um, or um, if I don't have enough dopamine, I am like, you know, motor things like chopping an onion um, like is really hard. It's like hard to coordinate. Um, but if I have enough dopamine or if I have like my, you know, if I have like music in the background, if I've had like my protein and my movement and I've had restorative sleep the night before and I've done something interesting recently, um, if I've taken my medications, um, all the different ways in which people get dopamine, um, I can chop an onion. So it's, it's very, it's very context specific and it's not intentional. Mm. Yes, I I also love dopamine. <laughs> you probably require dopamine. Yes, I know that for me, my dopamine often comes from fictional characters, which is why I love cosplay so much. Yeah. My current special fixation is Spamton, who I am dressed as, as I mentioned before. And that brings me a lot of dopamine. So I'm so happy that you consider it an authentic self and allow me to do my authentic self right now. Absolutely. And I encourage you to like seek out people and environments where it's totally legit to 
wear wear whatever makes you feel like your best self. Mm -hmm. However, I would. This is not about me. I would like to get back to All Brains Belong because it is such an important organization, and I know that one of the things you do is the vaccine clinic. Oh yeah. Um, I actually got vaccinated at the, at a vaccine clinic back in December, and it was very wonderful. I got the Moderna vaccine. Um, it was it was very nice because I am very afraid of needles. I have been my entire life because my veins roll, and nurses would have to hold me down to vac to vaccinate me or draw blood. And I think that that's why I'm afraid of needles. But anyway, it was wonderful going to All Brains Belong to get vaccinated because they were so accepting. They let me wear my special Spamton glasses so I could get my big shot as a big shot. <laughs> and Amen. it was very respectful. I got a nice, relaxing room to do it. And I was wondering if you could tell me more about that because you... <sighs> Sorry? I was wondering if you could tell me more about that. Absolutely. So when we first launched, um, this was uh, right around the time when um, COVID cases were starting to rise. The, um, the vaccination had just been approved for kids. And um, a lot of kids, um, it became um, more, more I, it came to, if I can rewind, can I, can I, can, can, oh, can, of I, course. I, I, I want to I try again. All right. So <laughs> right when we first launched, um, it came to our attention that there were many people, kids and adults, who were unable to access vaccination because of healthcare trauma, like bad experiences in the past, needle phobia, anxiety, sensory processing differences, like in the usual places or settings in which vaccination occurs, um, you know, typically healthcare settings or like large, you know, like shopping malls or high school gymnasiums and whatever. And my own five-year-old, I was like, there is no way that my sweet little love is going to be able to access COVID vaccination, like at a big loud facility. Like there's just no way that was happening. So I thought it would be, and it was um, a, a really, cool opportunity to demonstrate universal design giving uh, giving lots of different choices to people not because people disclosed any disabilities and requested accommodations um, but because it was offered to all people so um, people with all types of brains open to anyone who thought that they would benefit kids or adults you got to co-create an experience so you got to pick whether you wanted a brightly lit space or a dimly lit space. You picked your furniture. You told us what made what what, what brought you joy. You told us what uh, what stressed you out, so that we could make sure to avoid it. Mm -hmm. um, Unless we, that thing is needles. Well, yeah, we couldn't <laughs> avoid it completely, but we might be able to support. Let's say, for example, um, you know your. If, 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 if there was a way to, um, you know, use a numbing cream beforehand mm -hmm. or use um, a, a tool called the Buzzy Bee that uh, oh, vibrations I... kind of. Yeah, I don't know if you use Buzzy Bee, but I've but, heard um, of it. Yeah. So it's so, so it's uh, it's vibrations on the skin that kind of tricks the brain to attend to those sensations instead. Uh, anyways, and like legitimately um, influences, decreases the perception of pain. So like all this different stuff and because the dopamine bound brain needs dopamine, a lot of times um, when 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 you uh, you you support someone by giving them dopamine, for example, if I know that you uh, have a monotropic focus on unicorns and I have like a unicorn stuffy and I'm playing the, you know, a unicorn song, um, uh, you know, like you're literally going to perceive your sensory information differently. You're literally going to have a completely different nervous system experience than if, if you didn't have dopamine. And especially because like, you know, the story you just shared about, like you had an experience of being restrained. I mean, that's so many people's experience. Mm -hmm. Guess what? If you have trauma, you're going to want to avoid, not want to, you're going to have to avoid your limbic system's going to be like, 
this does not feel safe yes. when this trauma lives in your body. Even though I've been an adult for a few years now, I'm, and I can, I can sit for a regular vaccine experience, that still doesn't make it pleasant. The vaccine mm -hmm. clinic is the first va vaccination I've had that was actually pleasant, which is, you don't really think of vaccinations as being pleasant. It made something so horrible into something wonderful. I got a chance to talk about what I liked, and I, and I was 19 when this happened, so it's not just for kids either. It was a wonderful experience, and it's just one of the many wonderful things that All Brains Belong does. You are warming my soul. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, but that, that leads me to my next question. What are the other kinds of programs that All Brains Belong does? I know, for one, that you have a stuffy night, which I've been trying to attend, but have never managed oh, yeah, to. Yeah, we should, we should do that again soon. Yeah, so that was that came out of the Kid Connections program of bringing people together who love stuffed animals. Um, and we had like facilitated small groups where like the stuffies were interacting and they had like a stuffy dance party. And it was it was anyway, just bringing people together, um, you know, in a, a, about the thing they love. Um, one of our ongoing regular programs is called Brain Club. Um, every every week it's our community education series different topics of everyday brain life um that uh, uh right now we've been with the help of work of media we've been able to offer in hybrid format outdoors on the state house lawn um and by zoom and um that's that that's that's been i think a, a a really awesome opportunity to like bring people together to share their experiences and learn about different topics and um uh, and, and 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 has um helped helped in, in 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 small ways to really shift the perspectives um even of um people who've never thought about these topics before who get exposed to it in the first in the first context through brain club and we have um a number of like um educational trainings like we have free workshops for families on parenting like neurodiversity affirming parenting um, we do trainings for um, employers about neurodiversity and inclusion, um, which I think is like, you know, with with there's so many employers that are it's uh, they have a lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But like this is the missing piece, I think, of the DEI conversations. And so that's been a, a really a, a really lovely opportunity to um, you know bring in neurodiversity and access um, into into DEI conversations, um, and all of the archives of our um, our free educational programs they're all available on our website. So you can just you know it's free or by donation. Um, all the all the recordings are available. Wonderful. I, and I want to thank you for doing all of this work. Thank you for helping me spread the word. No problem. Um, when I was asked to do something for Orca Media, this was my first idea. I was like, I can help All Brains Belong, and I'm so happy to have that opportunity. That's amazing, Liam. That's amazing. Yeah, and this is probably going to go on YouTube, and I understand that you also have a YouTube channel. Could you tell me a little bit more about that? Oh yeah, so I personally, so me, me, me as Mel Hauser, um, I have a YouTube station for kids. It's a neuroeducation um, uh, station. I don't update it regularly because I'm like mm. busy doing all the things. You're doing this. Um, uh, I'm all, yeah, I'm doing this. Um, but um, this is um, like talking about concepts of play, social communication, interacting with friends, um, like uh, all, all the different ways our brains do things. Because I think that inclusion begins in toddlerhood, in preschool, learning about neurodiversity and how all the different ways our brains do things, like from, from the ground up, that's how we build an inclusive community. Um, so even, even kids with typically developing brains, I don't want them thinking that their brain is the default. I want like everyone to know that we all do things differently. Mm -hmm. And so I like talk about these concepts in language that I'm, that, I, that, that, that is meaningful for, for young kids. And I have like figurines and stuff yes. talking about this stuff. And I yeah. know you have a video series with an Elsa doll explaining these topics. And I found that very educational. I mean, 
I wish that I had education like that when I was a kid. Like, I've never been a big Elsa fan, but if they had my favorite characters, I would have listened all day to that. I would have listened to the most boring topics if, if like, the radio from Brave Little Toaster taught it. Oh, I remember Brave Little Toaster. <laughs> That's amazing. The radio That's from amazing. Brave Little Toaster, I think, was one of my first comfort characters. Either him or the Care Bears. Oh, Care Bears were, yeah, th that was, that was a big, like, that might have been my, like, monotropic focus yeah. of toddlerhood. Probably, yeah. probably Care Bears. I don't remember exactly. I was a toddler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the, uh, the uh, Luna went through a phase, a My Little Pony phase, which mm. kind of reminded me of the Care Bears in many ways, you know, because I have the kind of brain that connects all the things to all the things. Yeah, I can um, see that. Yeah, yeah, that's like one of our strengths, right? Like, it's like that's that's some um, that's that's some um, the systems thinking and like you know having the kind of brain that derives safety from systems. You build systems more more readily um, uh, than, than than other brains, but. The My Little Pony thing, similar to the Care Bear thing, was all about like the different personalities, traits, and strengths of different brains. Like to me, um, that was like you know a, a pretty neurodiversity informed program, even though it doesn't use that language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a particular favorite Care Bear or My Little Pony? My favorite My Little Pony, um, well, I have two. Um, and Luna says that I am a, 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 um, a, a blend of this. Mm -hmm. So there is uh, Twilight Sparkle, mm. who's like the, the, the yeah. studious scholar who like has a lot of brain rules and is kind of like pretty intense about them. Um, but mm. like, you know, is gets a lot of good things, you know, a lot of meaningful, important, systematic things done. Um, mm -hmm. And Pinky, that is like always on the go and do yes. all the things and do do do. Yeah, mm -hmm. those are my peeps. Pinkie Pie is my favorite, uh, and my second favorite would be Sunset Shimmer, who is kind of an antithesis to Twilight, very similar, but all became a villain. And I, I just I know all about <laughs> Sunset Shimmer. So Luna's very interested in the subtle villain, like the villain who's like not evil. But yes. like is just dysregulated mm -hmm. and ends up in situations um, that like do some pretty um, unhelpful things yes. because they're dysregulated. Yes. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sorry for getting so excited, but that's exactly what Spamton is, and I've never heard it described that way. So oh, I'm like, my my thing is coming up now. So you that feeling you just got that's dopamine. <laughs> um, so I love yeah. it. You don't get to pick what interests you. And so like you heard the thing, it connected to your thing, and now you're like a little bit interested. So yes. the dopamine bound brain has to do that all day long. But yes, I just, I, I love Sunset Shimmer for being an edgier Twilight Sparkle. <laughs> edgier, but I always like just want, like if, if Sunset Shimmer could have genuine connections, she would probably be better regulated and would probably have a better life. Yes. Sunset Shimmer is cast in the um, in this negative lens when really like Sunset Shimmer would be best to um, like if she could have friends and connection about her shared interests, she would probably be on a different path. She wouldn't be on the villain path. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you for putting it in better words than I can. You are just incredible at this, and this is a very important part of the interview, obviously, the My Little Pony section. Obviously, because that's like the real life thing. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to little kids about brains, um, whether it be my patient or my child, um, I find out what their monotropic focus is, um, and I talk about brains in that context, because the dopamine-bound brain needs dopamine in order to attend take in information like meaningfully apply it in their lives and so um like uh, for, for example um uh luna's now really really into um miraculous Do you know what miraculous i know what it is I've, I've never watched it but i know what it is it's pretty much the key to the i mean like my little pony i think is like has like so many keys to the universe mm -hmm. which is like you know like 
connection is the path to having a good life and all the different personality types and how you have conflicting access needs to negotiate. Like it's all these like big picture concepts, but um, so it is in, I, 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 I think the show is just called Miraculous, but it may have another name. Like, oh, Miraculous, like Adventures or Tales of Ladybug or something. Anyway, I think it's Adventures um, of Miraculous Ladybug. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Anyway, so I've been watching, Luna's been like super into this and it doesn't give me dopamine and it like <laughs> uh, freaks me out. So like I pretty much avoid it. But la- yesterday <laughs> something happened in an episode I was watching out of the corner of my eye with Luna. Um, and it was really showing that trauma for some nervous systems when not balanced by connection and support really put people on the path the dysregulated path um to destruction and that happens in real life like all the time and so bringing people together whether whether that be you know so many people experience trauma whether that be like you know macro trauma or micro trauma like it's all trauma in the nervous system that stays in the nervous system and influences the whole path forward but like connection and support makes a huge difference and so anyway in in miraculous the main villain I came to learn yesterday has a great deal of trauma and resultant dysregulation that puts him on a path where he thinks that the only way to feel good is to have unlimited power and dominance over other people. And it doesn't really work out very well. Sounds very Machiavellian. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, and so yeah, mm-hmm. I literally I just finished a term paper on Machiavellianism, so of course I wrote it about Spamton. <laughs> of course, yeah. Mon- the uh, dopamine membrane needs dopamine after all. Mm-hmm. One of the best papers I've ever written. But I, I get what you're saying. I I really love that idea for a villain. Yeah, yeah, and Luna at five years old um, will watch a, a like a cartoon and be like oh, the villain seems like she's just dysregulated. Um, or um, uh, uh, she'll make the connection between like um, Mother Gothel in Rapunzel and Maleficent in Sleeping Beauty. These are traumatized people who are dysregulated and have no connection who go on the path to destruction. Wow, this this is just like the smartest child, and I thought I was smart as a kid. <laughs> and and but, but like she's she is, she's ahead of her time. She like mm. she is literally and 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 and, and uh, you 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 are. I imagine like I imagine you have always been you, and so mm. I can imagine that you were like a a a, a smart little you. Anyway, oh. um, but like Luna uh, and Luna is my guru of keys to the universe. Is she your only child? She is my only child. Um, Mm. And when she was born, um, it was very clear to me that my environment was dysregulating her. Um, She has the kind of brain for which things were just like way too loud and moved way too fast and was just all too much. And so I had never, as a doctor, I had never seen an autistic infant, but I... I knew that I had had one and we had um, uh, amazing neurodiversity affirming therapists um, mm-hmm. in, in, in our lives who helped us support her sensory processing and like uh, design a life that works for her brain. Um, and we have a very Luna centric life and she's doing great. That is so wonderful. I cannot stress the importance of having good therapists enough. And I'm not just saying this is an advertisement for my occupational therapist mother. It is very important to have therapists at a young age. I mean, I, starting from the age of two, when I was diagnosed, I had therapists like 40 hours a week. And now I was able to give my high school graduations welcome speech. They didn't think I'd ever be able to talk, but now I'm talking to you and so I just want to give a quick shout out to all the therapists out there. Very important. Totally. And um, there, there are, I think that, you know, back, back when you were a kid, 
um, this was really before the at the, the 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 rising neurodiversity paradigm had really kind of come to light. And so sometimes um, some therapies now um, are about forcing neurodivergent kids to look more neurotypical. And that is that can be traumatic. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, um, you know, in 2022, there are, you know, there, there, there's a lot of different types of therapies that um, are about figuring out what does someone's best self look like? And how do we support um, you know, the modifications of the environment, the support of skills, the provisions of different ways of communicating um, that that anyway, that that can make a huge difference. So, yes, shout out to all the therapists, particularly the neurodiversity. Of yes, therapists. yes, definitely. Um, well, I have a few more questions left. A very important one. How can viewers support a all brains belongs mission oh man thank you for that question no one's ever asked me that before (laughs) um honestly like i am i know how to be a doctor and i know how to talk but like i am so um i have a lot of brain rules like i don't fundraise very well like i never ask for anything so because i think that there's no right way to support this organization because you can support the organization with a um, with donating your time as a volunteer. And we have an amazing volunteer coordinator who um, will kind of figure out what gives you dopamine and what 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 drives you and what you're interested in, and, like plug you in um, to 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 our work. Um, you can, um, you know, but you know, uh, you can support us by um, like on our website, we have like a registry of supplies and stuff we need and like sending us little gifts that way is like a super big help. Um, and um, uh, uh, financial gifts of any amount are a, like as a startup nonprofit, mm-hmm. it really, really gifts of any size make a very big difference to us and allow us to, you know, uh, grow, grow our capacity for long term success and, and sustainability. Because I think what we've learned um, in our, you know, we, we, we launched eight months ago and we've been on you know a a, a, like the 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 fast track we've really been able to do a lot in a short amount of time and the community's need quickly it became clear that the community's need has outpaced our ability to meet it like we get calls Mm -hmm. from you know random community members who need more services we're trying to build a a program a carved employment program for people with disabilities looking for project-based employment that where they can uh, work within their scope of skills and interests um, we are building support structures for kids who are unable to access their education in the traditional way we have all 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 of these programs that um that 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 we are so so grateful for the community support of these things and um that's 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 uh, that's that's another way that would be really really helpful to support our mission. Well, I would really like to say I appreciate that you have for donations you have the ability to buy specific items. I know there are some people who would want to make sure that their money went to a specific thing, so to make that an option, it it's kind of ties back into universal design. You have so many ways to donate. It just, I think it, the fact that you incorporate universal design into even these sorts of things is just wonderful. Thanks. Yeah, I have the kind of brain that I want to know what my donations are going to also. So it was important to, 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 to build that structure. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and uh, you know, there's even, there's even a place that even, um, you know, financial donations, like people can pick, um, you know, do you go to the healthcare bucket? Do you go to the community programs bucket? There's... We, we really want people to have freedom and choice um, over supporting the programs that are most meaningful to them. That is wonderful. And I have two last questions. First, yeah. what is your favorite thing about working at All Brains Belong? That is a great question. My favorite thing about the day-to-day work at All Brains Belong 
is that our team here, and by team, I would include um, not only the paid employees, but the key volunteers, the people on our community advisory board, like you, um, and um, our village, our growing village of um, uh, that 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 is in, is so invested in um, you know really creating this community of of learning and healing and connection, like it's it's this whole team. Um, uh, shares a value of interdependence, meaning we rely on each other. Independence is, I think, overly glorified. Autonomy is really important. Having mm -hmm. agency and self-determinism like that is paramount. But interdependence, relying on one another, is a core value here mm -hmm. and it's so profoundly normal to need and depend on other people and i i've never really worked in a setting like that before um and that's that's what i love most i'm surprised that interdependence isn't valued in more places because it seems so obvious to me that one person can only do so much i mean you yep. <laughs> it would be so obvious to me that everyone would know we all have different brains. Mm. But if you don't grow up with that narrative, um, you don't know. And so when I think about like the, the, uh, some typical ways in which independence is overly glorified, um, you know, uh, you know, be a big boy wipe your own butt um you know oh look you tied your shoes by yourself oh look you oh you did that all but and like it's all well intentioned but we are um sometimes differentially praising independence and not um reinforcing the profoundly normal part of having a culture of being connected and relying on other people. Yeah. From toddlerhood up. I know I didn't learn how to tie my shoes until third grade and that was a source of embarrassment, which- As opposed to, um, wouldn't it have been interesting if someone had said, there are all different types of shoes. Mm -hmm. Why did you pick the one that works best for you? Exactly. Why didn't I just use Velcro? Who knows? Yep. Yeah, because because there's a because there must be a right type of shoe. Like what? Um. Mm -hmm. So, but that's that's a way in which, um, you know, uh, people haven't kind of thought about it. That ableism. So the belief that it is superior to be able to do a thing as opposed to not do a thing ableism is embedded in subtle yet profound ways in so many aspects of our society i had never and thought of it like that i always thought that i was just efficient for taking so long to learn how to tie my shoes exactly so that's an example of how neurodivergent people grow up often mm. feeling broken and defective mm. Yes, and one last question, which is, which I think has already been answered throughout this discussion, but just to summarize, why is your work important? Thank you for the question. Um, the work at Operations Belong is so important because one in five people learns, thinks, and, commu and or communicates differently um, than society is designed for. And that group of people has um, higher risks of, or higher rates of health complications, of barriers to accessing health and education. 80% are unemployed, even those with college education. This is a group of people that is being systematically marginalized in a lot of the major um, domains of community life. 
And so shifting the broader conversation about neurodiversity and inclusion is an essential part of building an inclusive society. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I don't have anything else to add. That was perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It was wonderful. And it was been, it's been wonderful to have you. This has been Liam with Mel Hauser of All Brains Belong. Thank you for watching.